Okay, th thank you very much. Um, is the microphone loud enough? Can you all hear me, even in the back? Okay. Um, yeah, uh, Steve has always problems to pronounce uh, Karl von Ostietzky, <laughs> University of Oldenburg. Um, so this is uh, the university I'm from. I will tell you later where uh, approximately it's located. Um, Karl from Ossetsky uh, was a philosopher and uh, he fought for freedom. Unfortunately, he lived during the Nazi regime, uh, so he was killed by the Nazis. And uh, Oldenburg University is quite young, so it was founded in 1970. And so it was just to acknowledge um, his yeah, his uh, freedom fight um, against the Nazis. Um, Oldenburg University is not well known for its engineering faculty. I assume most of you are engineers here. So who's an engineer here? No, no one? <laughs> okay, a few. So I'm also working very interdisciplinary. So there's no engineering faculty in Oldenburg and I'm working between computer scientists and business and law. So that's a little bit of mixture of everything. And since I'm working on the resource management, um, it's more or less um, everything included. I'm not talking about my research group here. Um, as Steve has mentioned, um, I'm heading the Cascade Use uh, Group. Uh, our case study is car recycling. Um, but I'm here to speak about the, the energy research in Oldenburg um, because they uh, funded my travel here. So it's to acknowledge also the research. And since I'm teaching bioenergy in Oldenburg, um, it's also a little bit about my research in this field. If you want to know more about the recycling and what I'm uh, um, doing right now, uh, you can always go on my website or contact me afterwards. And we also have... Um, uh, refreshment after this talk, so just feel free um, to ask. Um, the system in Germany is a little bit different uh, from the Canadian uh, way, so there's no tenure track. So um, I have quite a long uh, postdoc phase um, uh, with me, um, and I'm funded through research grants. So that's a research grant that is mentioned here, so I'm funded by the BMBF. Uh, in Germany and um, can be allocated at any university. So that's quite luxurious uh, because I could, could choose uh, my university. I chose Oldenburg because Oldenburg is quite famous for renewable energy and this is what my talk is about um, and for sustainability. So I thought it's a good fit of the both of it even if there are um, few engineers. I hope that, you're, uh, that everyone is uh, uh, familiar with the word Energiewende. I didn't translate it uh, from German um, because in Germany, as I always said, everyone knows about the energy, Energiewende. So is everyone familiar with Energiewende? Do you know what it is? <laughs> or did you have to look it up? It means, it means energy transition. Um, uh, we, have a, we put lots of power into the transition from fossil fuels into renewable energies. And this is my talk about it and how did it start it and uh, what are our uh, experiences with it. Yeah, okay, so Oldenburg University. Um, Oldenburg is uh, far north uh, in uh, Germany. So um, I just pointed out, out uh, somewhere here. Let me just uh, use a pointer here. We have I can't see it closely. No. Uh, here, somewhere here. <laughs> so we are quite close to the North Seashore. The closest bigger city is Bremen, um, but also Hamburg um, is not far away. So it's uh, in the middle between Hannover and, and Hamburg, approximately. Um, most people here, especially here in this region, because we have a big Oktoberfest, uh, München is on the other side of our country, so I've never been to the Oktoberfest in Munich and I think I will never uh, be there, it's just far too expensive and too crowded. <laughs> um, so we are in the north of Germany where there's not so many industry as uh, in the southern part, so most industry is located here where also the, the big uh, uh, OEMs, especially the automotives uh, are, but uh, still, yeah, we have Volkswagen in this area. I think you all know about the Volkswagen discussion at the moment. Um, 
Yeah, I don't want to talk about this here because we're just talking about the renewable energies. Um, so Oldenburg is not a very big university. We have uh, about uh, 13,000 or close to 14,000 students. Um, and we started with education. So it was formerly an education uh, inst institute, institution um, for becoming a teacher in, in school. And then they added um, uh, cultural studies, uh, languages, of, of course, uh, humanity uh, and art and music. Then also economic and uh, social science um, were added and um, all the natural sciences um, as mathematics, uh, computer science, natural science. And uh, now uh, they've just started also a, a medicine a program. But uh, that's fairly new and no student has uh, already graduated from the medicine program. So the funny thing is that there's a strong connection between uh, Oldenburg and Waterloo. This is a picture I just did before I left Oldenburg and uh, the university is uh, just, just here. You might be familiar with the telecom here. But uh, what I would like to point out is this company here. Who knows this company? <laughs> That's the headquarter of Open Text is in Waterloo and they have also um, uh, a branch in Oldenburg. So I thought that's a, a nice connection between Oldenburg and Waterloo. Uh, but uh, Steve has already mentioned um, I was in contact with uh, Jatin and um, I asked Jatin for um, other contacts who are uh, also working in my field and he pointed out uh, uh, Steve and so that was a beginning of a very close cooperation. And uh, in the end of my presentation, I will also show you um, some kind of funding that we offer uh, for seniors like me, so a postdoc or a professor, coming uh, to Oldenburg uh, for getting, uh, starting other networks with Oldenburg University, um, and also for students, beginning with um, the end of master level, so you must be close to the end of uh, your master degree, um, or it is more or less intended for PhDs. But I will show you the details about it um, later. So now beginning with the topic um, of my talk, uh, the energy vendor or energy uh, transition. Uh, so we um, have lots of uh, uh, lignite uh, in, oil, uh, in uh, Germany. So most of our co uh, um, uh, power plants were uh, based on um, um, lignite. And uh, with the energy transition, we are just uh, cutting down the, the lignite power plants um, and of course the uh, nuclear power plants. So we still have a few. Um, but um, I have statistics somewhere else. Um, but uh, it was um, uh, intended that we are closing down all our nuclear energy. It's a little bit complicated in Europe because we are so many tiny countries and we share the energy uh, across the borders. So France has lots of nuclear energy, so we cannot just make a, a stop at the border and say, okay, no nuclear energy just from... Uh, uh, renewable energies, um, but uh, during the whole lecture, I will just talk um, talk to you about the advantages and disadvantages that we have uh, with uh, renewable energies. So energy transition means we want to have less of uh, these uh, coal uh, power plants and uh, nuclear power plants, and more or less uh, we want something like this. Uh, so I I didn't put a picture in it uh, with uh, photovoltaics, so we mean all the renewable energy. We have less hydro compared to, to Canada, um, but uh, most of our energy is coming from uh, wind energy and uh, photovoltaics. And since I'm teaching bioenergy, I will also <coughs> highlight the uh, bioenergy <coughs> component in it. Um, <coughs> I'm not sure if you are familiar that we are building uh, lots of offshore wind power plants uh, in the North Sea, uh, where we also want to share our energy with uh, Norway, for example. Um, the only problem is uh, to get the power uh, 
from offshore to the shore, so about all the, these cables that have to be connected to these offshore plants. There we had some problems and sometimes a delay of one year just to get connect uh, the offshore uh, uh, wind power plant. Um, and one year with an operating plant that is producing energy already, but we cannot deliver it. That was something uh, we were quite uh, struggling with. But uh, now the wind power plants are all uh, connected, so we have the power. And uh, if the wind is blowing on the North Sea, then uh, we can uh, supply the energy for the whole northern part of Europe. But if the wind is not blowing, and that's a disadvantage, um, then uh, we lack of en energy. So then all these coal-fired plants and gas power plants are coming into place uh, to step in. So what we do more or less is uh, the, yeah, the grid, um, the smart grid, and um, the storage of renewable energy. So it's not a problem with bioenergy because it can be stored, um, but with PV and wind energy, there are lots of researchers uh, at Oldenburg University who are working on the storage uh, of it, but I will um, uh, mention it later in my uh, presentation. So how did it start? Um, I just mentioned it uh, shortly in the abstract for this presentation. Um, the whole discussion in Germany started with the Chernobyl uh, disaster in 1986. So uh, I was going to school um, at that time and I knew that we were not allowed to go outside uh, during the disaster. It was just uh, uh, not a good communication uh, because uh, uh, during the disaster, because it was still the USSR, and um, there wasn't much information going out of the country, um, but uh, we had measurements here, and they found out that there's something wrong, and then they told us one week later after the disaster, so nothing compared to Japan, uh, where it was uh, obvious for everyone uh, right away. Um, they tried, it, uh, tried to hide it, and uh, we got the information a, a little bit later. But we were not allowed to play outside anymore on the playgrounds and uh, uh, everything. And then uh, this was the start where the politicians just started um, uh, to talk about it. Uh, so. Uh, do we want uh, to invest more in uh, nuclear energy or do we want to uh, step back and try to enforce the renewable energies? So um, the Chernobyl disaster and the Fukushima disaster um, are, as I'm aware of, the only um, classified uh, level five, uh, seven events. That was a maximum classification of uh, um, a nuclear disaster. <clears throat> so, um, I was looking for some pictures uh, of uh, Pripyat, that's the, the town uh, that, uh, where the um, nuclear power plant was. Uh, what's happening now um, in this uh, city? And I was just looking it up in Wikipedia and the explanation for the city now, it's an abandoned city in the north of U Ukraine. Uh, near the um, border with Belarus, and uh, this is uh, how it looks like now. Uh, so nobody is allowed to go there. Um, just uh, um, if you want to, you can have a special um, agreement that you go there for a few hours to make pictures, as this photographer did. And, um, <clears throat> and there's a good story on the uh, Telegraph, and you can look up uh, about 30 pictures um, how it looks like uh, today. And that was uh, for, for Germany and the politicians a reason, okay, we um, step out of it. And for me, being involved in recycling, um, uh, it's also a reason that we didn't find a solution now for getting rid of the nuclear waste until now. So I don't know how it works in Canada, but in Europe we are just shipping around all the waste, the nuclear waste, and just try to uh, put it in containers that they, uh, the radiation is not getting out. But uh, there's no final solution coming up yet for um, uh, nuclear waste. So there's lots of uh, news going on with uh, renewable energies. Sometimes it's positive, sometimes it's negative. Uh, uh, you all know about the NIMBY um, discussion, nobody wants it in their own backyard. Um, 
but uh, what um, the European Union um, is uh, saying that uh, we want to have tougher renewable energy targets, so the whole European Union um, is uh, playing together. And, um, but um, there's a discussion of uh, how many renewables we want in the grid. So we have a 30% uh, target or the European Commission proposed 27, so where do we end up? Um, so there's still lots of discussion and not a general uh, meaning of it. In Germany, if you uh, take the train and go from the north to the south, you, you see how the environment is changing from the north to the south. So in the north we have lots of wind energy, then you cross the middle and you see more uh, photovoltaics coming up. In the south you have lots of photovoltaics and also biomass. Um, so it's very regional which uh, renewable energy is in favor in this uh, um, area. You know that Germany is quite tiny. I think we have the same size as Nova Scotia. Um, but still, there are these uh, regions where they're in favor of one or the other renewable energy. And I can, cannot tell you why. So uh, we have lots of wind energy in our region, so it's uh, quite nice. I remember when we drove with our car at the Autobahn from the Netherlands, and we have one pin wind park after the other. You just get used to it. Um, and bioenergy is for us also a, a good solution uh, because in our region, in the northern part, we have the highest peak density in whole Europe. And peak density means also we have lots of manure from pigs, um, so it's a good um, solution to make energy out of the manure and then uh, use the digestate in the end. Um, yeah, and we often talk about the electricity and uh, the, the power generated from renewable energies and who is paying the price uh, for all this energy transition. So at the moment um, all the taxpayers um, are more or less uh, paying it uh, and the industry is uh, supporting it. Um, but um, yeah, I will show you about all our regulations um, I think in the next um, slide. Yeah, and um, I just put on some, some news uh, how we push the renewable energies in our region. So these are now uh, the uh, fact, facts about the energy transition uh, in Germany. So we have uh, climate mitigation uh, targets. Uh, you know about all the discussion about uh, GHG emissions and uh, if we want to cut them down. So um, even the US is now talking about reducing the CO2 emissions um, and they are talking to the Chinese. I think 10 years ago they wouldn't have talked to each other about this. Uh, so there's a high pressure coming out, up uh, about the CH, GHG emission reduction. Um, so our goal in Germany is uh, we want to reduce the GHG emission by 40 percent and we hope to uh, achieve this with uh, renewable energy and a nuclear uh, phase out by 2022. They're still arguing it to extend it a little bit because um, I think you all know once you have built up a power plant you want to uh, let it run as long as possible uh, to make it more efficient. Um, also the goals are competi competitiveness and energy security. Uh, besides uh, lignite, we don't have that man many uh, fossil fuels, so we would like to be independent from gas supply, for example, from Russia um, or um, other supplies. So with the renewable energy, it's also a task in Germany. Yes, we can provide our own energy and even sell our energy to other um, uh, countries. So we have uh, uh, core objectives on the strategic level. So we would like to reduce primary energy consumption and boosting energy efficiency. Um, but that's not including the rebound effect that if you uh, save energy, you even produce more uh, um, out of it. So that's, that's um, a little bit um, uh, hindering the uh, minus 40% uh, greenhouse gas emissions. 
and uh, uh, boosting the proportion of total energy consumption covered by renewable energy resources. So that's our main driver that we want to push the renewable energies. <clears throat> so then we have uh, steering targets on the steering uh, energy and uh, optimization with the key criteria cost efficiency. So therefore we have lots of economists in Oldenburg who work on these models. Uh, so when is the best time to feed in the electricity? Can we store it somewhere? Um, even with uh, electromobility, so can uh, Electro car, electric cars uh, be uh, a storage for all the renewable energies. Um, but since we are far behind the goal of our electric cars on the market in Germany, uh, I doubt that we could uh, reach it by 2020, so maybe in 2030 or 2040. Um, so what um, the optimization is about uh, the electricity consumption from renewable energy uh, therefore, we do get incentives when we use uh, energy from, or when we produce the energy from renewable energies. So everyone, um, especially bioenergy, is done by local farmers. So they have small biogas plants, uh, smaller than 500 kilowatt hours. Um, it's to run their own fields and their own manure from their own uh, pigs and cows. Um, and they get incentives for each kilowatt hour produced uh, from renewable energy, so from their bioenergy. Um, so they have uh, lots of intention of uh, feeding in this in electricity into the grid because then they get the incentives uh, from it. Also, they get incentives for the heat used because our biogas plant are in combination with uh, CHP plants, combined heat and power, and uh, you get incentives for all the heat being used. In winter it's easy because you just heat your own house, and in the summer the most popular solution for the use of heat in summer is drying wood. So we are working on this that uh, we have uh, another solution for the uh, use of heat. So if anyone here is working on uh, the heat, use it, especially if you can uh, use uh, uh, cold out of it, uh, um, so that you uh, can use it for, for cooling um, large uh, um, storage systems, um, then I would be happy to talk to someone here. Um, renewable energy in the transport sector, that's all the discussion that uh, electric vehicles are about. So if the electricity comes from uh, um, coal, power, coal uh, power plants, um, then there is no benefit of uh, having electric cars on the roads uh, because you still emit C GHG emissions because um, the electricity is produced uh, with uh, coal power plants and not with uh, carbon neutral energy. Um, yeah, and uh, the, the final energy production is also a topic like cut, cutting electricity consumption um, uh, in total, um, cutting final energy consumption for heat and also the consumption by transport. Um, this is actually now the discussion with a, with a Volkswagen uh, thing because, uh, yeah, it's another calculation, I would say. Um, yeah, and also we have individual uh, measure levels. It's also according to the region where you're in. So what kind of possible uh, possibilities do you have? Especially these tiny North Sea islands that we have. Uh, they're in the middle of the sea, so quite close to the shore, so they're not abandoned or something. Um, but they need to provide their own uh, energy somehow. So that's, that's a big topic at, uh, at Oldenburg University as well. Um, to have these self-sustainable islands uh, in our region. So there are some projects, I wasn't involved in the project, um, um, but uh, I might put you in contact with these people. So, uh, as, uh, of course, Germany is not the only one who is producing renewable energy. Um, I just um, uh, made a picture of um, 
the net electricity generation installations in the European Union. Um, a good source here is the EWEA uh, or EWEA. They provide you with all the statistics about your renewable energies in, in Europe. And um, you could immediately see the energy transition on this picture um, because you see that we have lots of new uh, installation and wind and PV. Uh, gas is being built because gas is, uh, yeah, they uh, switch it on and off uh, for the energy or for the stable, stable energy um, um, provision. And uh, so there are um, no further coal, nuclear, and fuel oil power plants being built uh, in this uh, time frame. And this will uh, continue in the future. So you could see that um, there's still um, a problem in renewable energies um, since we are still looking at the storage of the renewable energy. And if no wind is blowing and if it's during the night, uh, we normally, besides hydro, so hydro is a plus, so therefore the Canadians are quite, quite lucky, um, but we don't have um, that much in Germany. Um, so the only uh, a stable energy is coming from bioenergy. So therefore, we are pushing also the gas. Uh, some critical persons in Germany say look, most of the incentives should go to the gas power uh, plants because switching on and off a power plant, you know, it's not very efficient and not very good for the power plant. So they should get the incentives um, because it's very difficult for them uh, to operate because they were just being said, okay, now we need the energy and uh, the next day we don't need. Yeah, so this is now the picture because I'm here in, in Canada. I made myself also familiar with uh, the energy uh, uh, the share of renewables in the electricity uh, generation. So this is a picture of the G7 countries. Uh, so you see uh, Canada here, so you're very well uh, doing at the moment. Uh, here we have um, Italy. Uh, you see um, a high share of solar and wind, and um, of course also hydro. So the yellow part and the blue part on the uh, bottom is a um, um, main uh, driver in Italy. Um, then we see Germany here with lots of solar and wind and uh, less hydro, uh, but we are uh, also pushing biofuels and waste. So we have lots of uh, biogas plants uh, just based for um, food waste. So there is no conflict with uh, the food versus energy discussion with this waste. I don't know how many leftovers you have here on the campus on, on food. And uh, this is being digested in a, um, a biogas plant in Germany. But uh, they don't mix this with, with crops. So you either have the bio waste uh, digester or the, yeah, I would say the natural grown plants uh, in a, a digester with the manure. So manure can go with the plants. Uh, but not with the bio waste. And this is just regulated by uh, politics. Um, so they just made a cut and said, okay, we either have bio waste or we have bioenergy from renewables. Um, and you also just get the incentives for the renewable energy from, um, uh, from the plants and not for the bio waste. Um, because the waste is there anyway. <laughs> Um, France is uh, also lots of hydro and solar and wind and very tiny of uh, biofuels. Um, I see just geothermal is just showing up in, in Italy here a little bit. I know a project at Aachen University, so they're using geothermal energy as well. Um, but I thought it's just a, a pilot thing uh, just for uh, showing what um, Aachen is capable of with its uh, research. I think they just provide the, energy, the um, university or city with it and not, uh, as they are not selling it in a, a big style. Yeah, I don't go through all the countries. Um, it's just a matter of uh, 
showing um, who has a, a big share of renewable renewables and electricity generation. Uh, also, we have a, a picture on the heat on it as well. So now I'm uh, going into closer aspects uh, what um, I and my colleagues are doing in Oldenburg University. Um, I start with bioenergy, um, since this is a course I, I'm, I'm teaching in the renewable energy program. The renewable energy program, the PPRE uh, study, the master program, uh, we always have Canadians in this program. Um, so it's a very restricted program. Uh, we have about 600 applicants for this master program and only 25 are accepted in this uh, program. And it will stay the same because it's a very personal uh, master program. Uh, and if we open it up to more students, we cannot uh, do it uh, in uh, this kind of uh, tutoring anymore. Um, this program was established 30 years ago. So I, I haven't uh, made so many um, um, a search for it, but I think it's one of the first renewable energy program that, uh, where you could do your master worldwide. Um, I don't know if you know an older program, but 30 years, I think it's, it's a quite, quite a thing. It started with the photovoltaics uh, division at Oldenburg University. Uh, because I started uh, quite early and I thought, oh, maybe we should also do something uh, because it started with all the, the energy uh, transition uh, discussion and I thought, okay, Oldenburg is, uh, we talk about sustainability and renewable energies, so we must be a university who's providing renewable energy, a master program um, and on international level. So that's uh, quite, a, quite a nice program and I always enjoy teaching in this course. So that's the reason, it was a region I'm coming from. Uh, so lots of green area, also very wet, so we often have rain. Um, this is a picture from the North Sea coast, and here you see already one of these North Sea islands. This is Baltrum, um, the island Baltrum, so very uh, tiny, um, 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 island, and here you see you're quite familiar with, with the geese, uh, uh, goose, geese, yeah, um, and uh, they need this area, so it's some kind of uh, nature reserve because they need this area to settle down just to get some more energy to fly in warmer regions or in summer just to stay there. Um, the point why I'm showing this is that there is Maintenance being done in this area, so it's a nature reserve, so normally you cannot harvest any bioenergy from it, but this grass has to be kept uh, uh, quite low because otherwise the geese won't stop here and this is their, their place to go. Um, so they uh, do maintenance in it, sustainable maintenance, and this material can be used in bioenergy plants. So we did a project on sustainable bioenergy uh, with regional focus. Um, so we just um, uh, were uh, concentrating on some areas with some case studies. Uh, so here you have um, a closer look. Oldenburg is not on it, but this is the autobahn across uh, the Netherlands. This is, this is Netherlands here. Um, and the autobahn goes right away to Oldenburg, so Oldenburg is here, where you see the letters here. And we had a case study um, in this area, so we had one tiny city here and a very rural area. And the other one, um, that was a picture I've just shown you, uh, is here on, um, yeah, on, the, on the coastal area where we also have some algae because we have uh, um, high tides. Um, and uh, so they try to keep it some, somehow clean in a sustainable way. It's also a tourist area um, here, so they have other drivers in, in this area, uh, but um, I wouldn't say that they're off-grid, so we, we have a good um, energy supply in, in Germany, but they were also looking of um, either getting rid of their bio-waste, uh, because there are lots of cows uh, in this region, uh, and how to do it in a sustainable way. 
the disadvantage of bioenergy is that you, you would never transport it for more than 100 kilometer, I would say. Uh, the farmers that we were sp speaking to, they told us 50 kilometers is the threshold. Uh, otherwise, you pay more for all the petrol with uh, driving around instead of um, um, gaining the energy from it. So if you drive too much, then it's not carbon neutral anymore because you have to add all the fuel uh, in it. So that's what Steve and me are doing in the life cycle assessment. Um, because you have to include also the transportation, otherwise it would, doesn't make sense. So um, we were working with the GIS experts um, at Oldenburg University. We have uh, uh, quite uh, good people over there. And we were assessing the maximum potential in this region. So we were just uh, erasing um, some, some areas where there is no... Uh, um, uh, no biomass at all, so the black spots are streets and cities, and uh, the blue spots are rivers. But rivers need some maintenance as well, because you have to cut the grass um, in the end, because otherwise the, the plants are taking over. And um, at the streets, we have a special regulation now, and you also get some incentives for it. Uh, we have uh, the roadside uh, maintenance, and we also plant more flowers now at the roadsides because it's not harvested by, by the farmers um, because of all the bee discussion and uh, the lack of uh, um, nutrients for, for the bees. So they encourage every farmer to plant flowers uh, on the side of their fields and they get extra uh, money for it. And this is harvest, harvested uh, twice a year and this is uh, not good for uh, feeding animals, and this can go into biogas plants. So with GIS, we could measure the maximum length of these roads, of these waterways, and we were assessing the maximum potential if it's harvested. So normally it's not, but we know that's the maximum, and we are somehow below it. Um, so we were, besides the GIS and the maximum amount of bio um, energy supply in this area. We were looking at this whole supply chain, so we were concentrating on supply chain management um, in cooperation with the Netherlands. Uh, also the northern part of Netherlands has the same problem as we have. Um, so we were looking at the material supply, so where are the materials, also who are the stakeholders. At the um, North Sea region, we spoke to the local community, to the mayor, and um, now the swimming pool of uh, this village is heated by the biogas plant. So they made an agreement with the city, so that uh, was quite good when people are talking to each other. So we did a lot of talking uh, besides this, because uh, uh, the technology was already there. Um, so logistics, of course, so we need to measure how far is the longest distance, but the farmers, farmers knew it already, so we didn't need any research for this, but we could do the LCA for this. Um, of course, the conversion biomass to energy. In the Netherlands, uh, they use more gas. They have a much better um, a gas grid as Germany, I think 10 times uh, better, more distributed. So it's much easier for them uh, to get to the next, next gas grid, whereas in uh, Germany it's rather the um, CHP solution since they also get the incentives. So um, um, there are different needs and approaches and also regulations in the both uh, countries. So we just compared uh, it. Um, grid and the distribution, that's what I mentioned, was either use the gas or the electricity, and then uh, where and how is it used. So I'm now um, going on to wind energy research. So if you need any publications about this, um, just uh, either write me an email or uh, approach me later in the, during the refreshments. Um, wind energy uh, research in Oldenburg is much bigger than bioenergy uh, because there are just two or three people who are involved in bioenergy uh, research in Oldenburg. But in wind energy, we have a very large um, um, support and institutes who are just working on 
wind energy, all kinds of wind energy. Uh, we even uh, write, wrote, um, or I did a workshop on material uh, life cycles in wind energy, and I leave a copy here of this book, uh, where we were um, concentrating on the materials involved in wind energy and what is being done after the life cycle of a wind turbine. So, so uh, we concentrate on the life cycle of wind energy, of course, uh, what is all included. We have the, the wind turbine, um, we need all the materials, so we have the transportation of the materials to the production plant, um, the production itself is emitting CO2, I think you are all familiar with it. And especially that's something nobody wants to talk about it, uh, we have waste during production. And this is um, a point I'm concentrating on because this is always neglected in most of the ACAs um, because they just uh, take, uh, for example, I'm working on the rotor blades as such. So you just measure so how many materials in the rotor blade, where does it come from. Uh, you look in the inventory and everything is fine. But since there is n nearly no publication on the waste related to a rotor blade, for example, um, you cannot include it in an LCA, so that's, that's a big problem. Um, so if we just um, think about a, a normal rotor blade, about 60 meter long, uh, you know it's made of uh, carbon fiber and glass fiber mixed with resin, so very difficult to recycle in the end. Um, what do you assume? How much waste do you have, so in percent, um, how much waste do you generate per um, the production of one rotor blade. What is a guest number? What do you think? How heavy is the rotor? How heavy is the blade? Sorry? How heavy is the um, It's about seven tons. Something between three and a half and seven, so, so but a few tons. Sorry? Yeah, in percentage it's about 20%, no, a little bit more. Sorry? Just, just say a percentage number, then it doesn't matter how large it is. So you guess? 20? <laughs> yeah, but if, the, if you have a small rotor blade and it's only one ton, then <laughs> you have to have 50% waste, so. Five? Yeah. Any other number? Uh, white gas, twelve percent. Okay, um, it's about thirty to forty percent waste during the production. It's uh, I show you a picture later. It's lots of handmade uh, being done with these rotor blades since they are so large. Uh, the processes that are being uh, automated, but not the whole rotor blade, and. Uh, I will show you some of these materials um, that are left. Um, so I think I can just uh, skip this slide. Um, you all know about the production, the energy, CO2 emissions. Um, this is a production of uh, rotor blade. Um, um, SGL Rotec uh, is a company located in close to Bremen. It's just outside Bremen, so it's already in Lower Saxony, but the closest city is Bremen. And you can see the people here uh, walking inside one half of this rotor blade. Um, and they are the, the two halves of the rotor blades. And uh, you just finish uh, each half of the rotor blade and at the end you just flip them over and then you, you heat it so that the resin is just going liquid and then it's cooled down and you have your finished uh, rotor blade. So it's a very human intensive pro process and uh, here you can see uh, the layers of uh, fiber. So you can see that here's a layer, then there's a next layer on top of it. So they're laying layer on layer but in different steps. And um, Bremen University for example is working on some kind of how you lay these uh, fabrics with the uh, least uh, waste in the end. Um, because you have these big rolls where the 
uh, glass fiber or carbon fiber is on it, and then this roll is just going along the whole rotor blade, and in the end, you always have a, a rest left on this roll, and this can sometimes be used in some of these areas, so they are thinking, in the end, maybe uh, instead of a long row, they are just uh, lying it uh, in another angle and so on. But um, there's still lots of research being done how exactly you lay all these fibers uh, along the rotor blade with the least uh, waste included. And I think it's also company related. I think some companies are better than the 30%, but I've also seen companies who are worse than this. Um, so my uh, research is also what do we de do with the waste on the production of rotor blades? Because a discussion with the re recycling of rotor blades is always, oh, they are there for the next 20 years, or in Germany we are repowering everything, so everything is going to Eastern Europe. Um, but we still have uh, a lot of waste, and uh, the products, uh, the waste products are very, very difficult in the end. Um, so this is a reming, remaining fiber from um, the glass fiber. Um, so this can be used by, by other companies as well, so that's uh, not a problem. And if you have a remaining fiber from carbon fiber, so you, have even, um, uh, you can even sell it and get some money back from it. <clears throat> so there's now uh, a shift to more carbon fiber in rotor blades because they are being, getting bigger and larger. So they must uh, um, uh, cope with uh, more uh, strength. Um, and so there's more carbon fiber in it. So the pressure on getting these fiber back is getting higher at the moment. Um, this is some kind of a plastic foil you do on, uh, you do on top of it that the resin is staying uh, inside the fiber and the rotor blade, and you just uh, take it off once it's it glued together. Um, this is a very, very hard material, because this is exactly the layer where you, um, um, when, so you have uh, this long rotor blade here, and you have to ensure that everywhere the resin is going to, so you have these, some kind of canals where the resin is going through, and um, this is exactly the remaining of the hardened uh, resin in it. So that's very complicated to uh, recycle this. So you mainly burn it and recover the energy from it. Um, I'm also, since uh, Steve and me are working on uh, critical metals as well, so the turbine, um, of course, is a driver in recycling. Um, so it's already being remanufactured, so nobody is dumping a turbine in the end. So they know of the value al already, and uh, we just um, did a survey on how much uh, raw earth is in average uh, in uh, permanent magnets in uh, wind turbines. So we d more or less did a liter literature review um, on it and how many kilograms of rare earth we have per megawatt in uh, wind energy if there are only permanent magnets uh, in the wind turbine. So that's a quite, quite a, a large number, uh, nearly 700 kilograms per megawatt. So there's already a driver uh, for critical metals in it. Um, so the content of critical metals and permanent magnets, so uh, once you know, know how many um, uh, rare earth there is um, in your turbine, um, then you also know, uh, you can calculate it back, how much dysposium, neodym, and terbium you have allocated in these uh, wind turbines. Um, we are uh, working with the uh, um, European Commission uh, together, the JRC uh, Council, and uh, they try to map all the wind turbines in Europe and uh, what materials are related to each wind turbine. So that's quite complicated because uh, uh, information is not always shared. Um, it's a new uh, technology coming up, so it's not as regulated as in other uh, regions. But it's also uh, uh, different from country to country. So for example, bioenergy in Netherlands is monitored 
very well and you have lots of databases you, you can access. In Germany, it's not. So in our project with the Netherlands together, they had uh, lots and lots of data and we had just three data from our own farmers who provided us with, with the data. So there's also a um, relation between regulation and uh, um, the information that you can get and the databases. So I'm now just summarizing uh, what Oldenburg researchers are doing. So uh, the wind energy and bioenergy is the research I'm uh, involved um, at. We have uh, an um, energy um, research association. It's called uh, Enerio, Energy Research in, in Oldenburg. And um, we are uh, different participants who just share their knowledge about uh, energy um, as such. So we have um, about 12 uh, um, participating professors from physics, computer science, economics, uh, um, chemistry and, and others um, and visit almost 300 researchers uh, involved um, yeah and making it the largest energy research site in Lower Saxony there are of course other people and we yeah, we of course talk to each other um, I'm closely cooperating with Next Energy and I just did a publication with them on lithium ion uh, battery uh, batteries um, and the materials involved in it, um, similar to the research that uh, um, uh, Steve is doing. And uh, EVE Research Center is a non-profit organization, so it's not university, but it's working uh, closely with uh, university together, and it's located on the campus, so it's just walking distance uh, for me. Um, and this is funded by the industry and the public sector. So um, they get also money from the EVE and the EVE is providing our energy in our region. So they are supplying the grid. So they have uh, different topics um, in, um, in the institute. Um, of course, photovoltaics, because we have a strong connection to the physics department in, uh, in Oldenburg. Um, then uh, fuel cells. We just had a workshop um, in, in June where we were sharing knowledge also with uh, experts from Canada, from uh, UVic and uh, BC. Um, uh, then also energy storage. So what kind of batteries, for example, cell components, a grid, and so on. Um, energy systems and uh, system modeling, so they're closely together. Because, um, for example, they're working on the house solution, where you have the photovoltaics of the roof, uh, the battery cell in the cellar, and um, the electric car in front of your, your house, and how you can have a safe, uh, sustainable house with, with energy supply. Um, so this is roughly uh, what they are doing. So if you want to have a closer cooperation with these people, and I give you also a possibility uh, for, for traveling purposes, um, you can always connect these people. Um, they're all the, the email contacts um, are here, and I think this presentation will be uploaded somewhere anyway. Um, so I'm here through the DAAD program EPIT for All. I think or I hope is some of you at least should be familiar with the DAAD. It's a German um, exchange uh, program and mostly students are traveling with it, it uh, but also professors and uh, uh, postdocs can travel with it. So we would like to encourage uh, um, PhD students to come to Oldenburg to do their PhD uh, with it and to increase the internationalization at uh, Oldenburg University. So the funding is already ongoing until um, or for the next two years already, so there's a chance within the next two years to uh, get connected with it. Um, it says it's a PhD program, a renewable energy, but it's also for um, the tutors um, to get connected with the right researchers if it uh, fits and so on. So the structured doctorate programs we have uh, 
is uh, neurosensory sensory science and systems, interface science, environmental science and biodiversity. So it's rather on uh, marine science. Uh, ECBM is uh, uh, on European level quite, quite advanced. Um, then we have the PhD program Renewable Energy, where I'm more or less uh, involved. And of course, a fundamental physics and applied uh, uh, mathematics. So, so these are uh, doctoral programs that uh, can be looked up on the web page. But the funding that we have is uh, uh, per person, and you can connect with uh, anyone at university as you want. So also on the economic side, um, if you do some, some modeling of the grid, for example. So this uh, program uh, is, of course, administered by the DAD and financed by the BMBF. Um, BMBF is the same organization that's funding my research group. Uh, we have about 150,000 euros per year from the DAD. And uh, we have, um, you see a name here, Andreas Günther. He is the one uh, who is doing all the yeah, uh, uh, questions. So if you have questions, I would always refer to um, Andreas. Uh, we have travel and uh, stay support, so you, can, you get an allowance for, for the travel uh, to Germany and a daily allowance with it, and uh, normally it, it also fits. Um, for student exchange, and we could also do an interdisciplinary doctoral student workshop. I did it in June. Um, as I mentioned, uh, Canadians have already participated, and the last one I organized with uh, Steve together. Yeah, um, and of course the goals are to strengthen and increase the internationalization, and, uh, but I don't have to tell you about internationalizations. Canadians are quite good in it. And uh, we would like to encourage or uh, um, increase our international research cooperation, and therefore uh, I'm here. So this is a rough data. I don't want to go through uh, everything on it, and I'm uh, nearly done with my presentation. Here, um, so I I am here through the um, travel from uh, Germany. I'm travel for organization or marketing. So I'm marketing energy, renewable energy research in Oldenburg. So I'm allowed to stay here a maximum of eight days. So I just arrived uh, last weekend. I'm leaving on Saturday again. Um, but for uh, PhD students, so for you it would be this uh, column here because this is from Germany and you're coming to Germany. So research in Germany for a PhD student would be uh, a maximum of three months. So that's something where you can uh, also do a little project uh, in it. Uh, you can also attend a conference in Oldenburg, uh, but then it's a maximum of five days. Um, you can do an internship as uh, yeah, we hardly have any bachelor, but here it says bachelor or master student. Um, less than three months. Short visit for a master graduate or student who would like to get information if they could do a PhD program in Oldenburg. Um, and as a lecturer, if you want, would like to come to Oldenburg to present something, your research, your, to make connections with, with us, um, you uh, can have a maximum of eight days to stay with us, with a lump sum for, for your traveling. Um, also, there's a link about all the detailed information on it. Um, we have often calls for the application. You just fill out a form, and then we decide who is coming. Uh, you should contact someone at Oldenburg University before you come to Oldenburg, because it would increase uh, the success of your application. Yeah, therefore I'm here. I'm at the end of my presentation. And I think we have now a Q&A round. And uh, if it's not uploaded somewhere, the slides, uh, just contact me, and I will provide you with the slides. OK, thank you very much. Uh, a good little bit of time before uh, there's a light refreshments next door, but uh, you have a microphone, so why don't you take some questions, please? Repeat yep. the question in the microphone. Yes, I was instructed. So, do you have questions? Yes. Yeah. <clears throat> I'm wondering about the whole energy transition uh, program that you started your presentation with. 
Uh, you hear mixed reviews of, of this of this success. Some people talk about it being a, a huge success, all the, all the renewables and the large percentage. Other people com complain that uh, with the nuclear decline, there's still still a gap, and that you're even though you're mitigating, you're filling the gap with with with, with coal and natural gas, and uh, energy prices are increasing, and that some industry is leaving Germany. So there. There are mixed uh, reviews, and so I'm wondering what the perspective is with, within Germany about, uh, I guess the, from an economic perspective, certainly you're, you're, you're increasing renewables a lot, but what's it doing to the economy is, is essentially the question. Yeah, so you, the question is about the mixed reviews from yeah. all kind of yeah. sites, yeah. and sure. what so is the... What, what's really the case? What's, what's really the case, yeah. Um, so the, the point is that we have the Renewable Energy Act, the EEG, and um, that if you generate electricity from renewable energies, you get incentives. And that's uh, where the Netherlands always envy us with bioenergy research because they don't get these incentives. So it's much easier for a farmer in, in Germany to build up a bio, uh, bioenergy plant compared to the Netherlands with the same conditions. So the area is about the same. So therefore, there's an economic uh, driver for it because they push you. If you stay in this country, you get the incentives. If you're outside, you're not. Um, the um, renewable energies that are being produced in Germany, they get all the incentives. But I think you also mentioned the industry that is yeah, leaving the Germany. Who like manufacturing, like what, what do they do with the higher energy? Costs? Yeah, um, if you um, use uh, too much energy, or this energy intensive um, industry, uh, they don't have to pay this extra money for uh, fostering the Renewable Energy Act. Uh, so if you provide an energy management system, um, then you um, are allowed uh, to uh, not to pay these uh, incentives. So it means a few hundred thousand uh, euros uh, per year for these companies. You just have, what well, not just have, but you have to provide a uh, certified energy management uh, system. So they lowered it now to also uh, small and medium companies uh, because they started only with the big players. So all the small players were just uh, criticizing that we it, uh, we support the, the big industry and all the small medium uh, enterprises were just left behind. They have changed it um, two years ago that also these companies uh, get uh, um, uh, don't have to pay these uh, extra renewable. Yes, yes. But it's uh, still under the discussion which one is the best way. So it costs money. So also we are um, um, renewing the grid from the north to the south because we have all the, the wind energy in the north and it's, it cannot be transported to the southern part of Germany right now. And then we still have the discussion with all the grid being built in this because uh, these uh, 318 <laughs> kilowatt uh, uh, energy suppliers. Yeah. I think there is no real answer for it. There's always pros and contras, and uh, it's a big discussion. And I think, therefore, um, therefore I also chose the Energiewende because this is, I think, often in the media. So, and people are just waiting for results. So is this the solution or is it not? Uh, especially with all, all our um, offshore wind parks being con connected or not. <laughs> More questions? Yes? So you said uh, there was like 30 to 40% of waste coming out of the production of uh, wind plane, right? Yeah. That's about 30 to 40, it can be 30 to 40% uh, percent of production waste. That was the waste I've seen by myself. Yeah. Um, it can be that there's less or even more, but... Where does it come from, like mostly, well, what's the composition of the 30 to 40% of waste? So where, where do the waste come from? What kind of waste? Uh, therefore, I've shown the, the picture with, with the uh, remaining waste. So this is all the supporting material to either get the resin uh, into these layers of, of fiber. Um, 
So, for example, this is not needed for the uh, rotor blade itself, but it's needed for the production of the rotor blade. So you just have, uh, you need um, a supply for the resin of going inside all these areas in the large rotor blade. And in the end, this is, is left because you don't need it anymore. The resin is still in and it's uh, glued together. Um, so this is supporting material. Uh, this is also just a foil you put um, around it because you need a vacuum. Uh, you suck a vacuum and then the resin is just flowing everywhere. You don't want to have bubbles uh, inside a rotor blade when it's rotating uh, because it's not good for the stability. Um, um, only this material is material that's left over from all these layers of uh, um, a glass of fi carbon fiber that is used for the production of the rotor blade itself. We were looking at all the additional waste that needs, that we need for the production of this uh, rotor blade. And you have lots and lots of materials. And this is also a driver for the uh, rotor blade manufacturer uh, because they are sometimes paying uh, lots of money just for we are not allowed to dump this material because there's too much carbon in it. We have a regulation on uh, the composition of waste, so this is more, more or less um, being uh, uh, fired in a waste, uh, waste processing plant. What's it called? If you fire waste? Incinerator, incinerator yes. So it's, it's more or less going to an incinerator here. Besides this, these fibers can be re reused, and this is uh, what I'm working on with the, with the cascade use of materials, so it's not being used in um, uh, wind turbines anymore, but it can be used in other materials where you need uh, uh, glass fiber or even carbon fiber. And here is also um, a big link to the aviation industry, because planes are made of a, a similar component. Um, also the cars, because cars and uh, uh, carbon fiber is also coming up right now. But this material would never be used in, in cars anymore because the cars have a very, very high standard. Um, but all these materials could in the end come together and can be used in other applications. So glass fiber and carbon fiber if they're pure and not uh, contaminated with resin, um, there is a second use for it as well. And it's our part just to find all these partners where they are located at. What's here, question? Yeah, I had a question about um, sort of the overall transition in Europe. Um, so Scandinavia's got a, a lot of hydro. Um, and we have a somewhat similar situation here where the U.S. has a lot of coal, we have a lot of hydro, and there's a, a number of problems uh, connecting the variable renewables further to the south with hydro. It seems like that would be uh, a way to, to combine the dispatchable and, and the variable. Uh, right now, so the coal's not flowing down in Germany. Do you know what are the barriers to, to that integration? Is that, is that a conversation that, that's being had? Or you, you mean the, the barriers between uh, Hydro and coal, and the same situation the, in Germany the with the renewables. To, to connecting uh, the hydro, the, the grids uh, yes. in Scandinavia to, uh, to the rest of Europe, so that when the wind isn't blowing and the sun isn't shining, uh, hydro can be supplied rather than using coal or gas. Yeah. Um, so the connection within Europe, since there are so many countries nearby and they have to share the energy somehow. Um, so they're working on the connection uh, with, uh, with Norway of all these offshore uh, wind parks. Um, it's not finished yet. And also, um, as I mentioned, the, the grid from the northern part to the southern part, it's always in the news uh, because of all the NIMBY discussion. Nobody wants to have the grid going through his own garden. I think there's another perception uh, uh, about the grid in Northern America compared to, yeah, I'm from Germany, so I know more about the German uh, attitude towards it, but the, the NIMBY discussion is quite high against uh, the grid. So they are uh, fighting against the grid being established. 
So everybody wants power and especially renewable power, but connecting it, it should rather be underground and there are other problems that are coming into place. Um, a big, big discussion and still not solved. So it's not only, okay, we have renewable power here and other power here, we just make a connection. It's not that easy. It's very difficult at the moment. Lots of organizations fighting against these uh, power grids. Also depending on the region. <laughs> The 40%, yeah. <laughs> it's five years and so. Yeah, yeah. That was uh, very uh, motivating. And um, it's my personal opinion. I doubt that they will achieve it. But that was the goal. You know, uh, the goal is made by special people. <laughs> it was very motivating. And I think they wanted to set a goal. But it's the same goal as uh, in Germany, we said we, in 2020, we want to have one million electric cars uh, on the market, and we are far, far behind. <laughs> Maybe now they would give some more incentives uh, since about the uh, OEM discussion at, at the moment, but uh, we don't know. Steve. Oh, oh, oh no, do you? Oh, while this slide is up, I'm in Canada, we sell uranium to the world. We established a new agreement with India that has come into effect. And I'm always surprised how Germany, and in particular, has this phobia of nuclear power. And you began with that. Mm -hmm. And yet, if we do want to achieve our greenhouse gas emissions, it could be done if you maintain the nuclear, the nuclear energy while transitioning in these renewables. So I can understand public sentiment and I can understand political response to that, but what's the scientific or engineering understanding of nuclear? And is there any consideration of, of giving more on that issue? Um. Yeah, the nuclear power um, um, discussion and why the Germans are so, what did, how did you? Phobic. Phobic. Uh, scared. That we are so phobic and scared about the um, nuclear power is all these accidents that have occurred. And we, we, are still, we still have the opinion those that is. Those accidents are trivial compared to the number of deaths from coal, part of particular matter. Yeah, but it damaged the environment. And environment, okay, if Those people are dead, the they're not coming back again. It's trivial compared <laughs> to, the, to the damage that's occurring from greenhouse gases associated with coal. Yeah. <laughs> you're even non greenhouse gas damage from coal, right? Even, even non yes, yes. The greenhouse gas emissions from nuclear power, of course, is uh, very low, so it can compete uh, with renewable energies and not, not with uh, coal power plants. So, Yes, I agree with you. So, uh, especially when we work on LCA and we just change the, the grid, so uh, nuclear power is always uh, quite good compared to uh, coal power plants. Yeah, I was growing up in the 80s, so I was just trained to <laughs> our environment. So, what should I, should I say? Um, but I can assure no, you. There's a, public, there's a public opinion that is very powerful, I'm sure. Yeah. Um, we still haven't found, uh, so we both work on the life cycle and also the end of Don't the life me. cycle. Yeah, um, there's still not an end of life solution for nuclear power. And I think this is something we should more work on um, because what are we doing with all the nuclear waste? Just making big tons and dig it in some holes and if a few centuries later somebody's digging up uh, all these nuclear waste and thinking what kind of people have been living here uh, that they just put everything in these tons. Uh, so that's, I think, not a sustainable way if we cannot close the loop. And this is still a discussion in nuclear power. It's not a closed, not even an open loop. loop. We are just producing more and more waste and the waste is just shipped around. 
I don't know if we have started already of uh, shipping it in the outer space <laughs> already. But there, Was there it are, done? There, one of the other repercussions of Chernobyl and so on is that a whole generation of engineers was dissuaded from doing nuclear engineering. But theoretically, there are reactors designed that could burn spent fuel, that could reduce it and have a different amount of radioactivity. Yes. I mean, it's conceivable that if Germany spent the amount that you spent on wind and solar to new generation nuclear that would burn spent fuel, it would be a totally different story. I mean, it's conceivable. Um, but, but in the West, countries are, don't have the appetite for mega projects. Uh, I mean, the United States could be doing it as well, and, and they're not. So the nuclear is happening in China and in India now. Right? Yeah. So it wasn't a question, rather a comment no, the, on the, the nuclear? No, it's not a question. The, the point that I was making mm. is that, that there are technologies out there. Uh, your point was that there's no solution to nuclear waste. And my, my response as a technological optimist was that there, there is research and, and conceivable nuclear solutions where, where you, you could deal with it. So that's, that's, that's a point. It's not really a question. Yeah, um, the problem with the nuclear waste or with the technical solution is, um, I think it's the same discussion as um, when we were um, establishing all the wind power plants. I think five years ago, I wasn't allowed even to talk about recycling of wind energy. They thought it's a negative attachment to renewable energy. Now they change a little bit with it, and maybe it's the same with nuclear waste that there might be solutions or research are even uh, doing research on that. I'm not aware of it right. because it's nothing that media would like to show that there is eventually a solution for it. Uh, but who started with it or uh, where the solution? I just want to make aware of it, right. even with all these uh, wind power plants that are being established in the North Sea. What is going to happen with all these wind power plants in 20, 30 years? So that, that was my, my book about um, what, what are we doing with it. And other uh, critical people also said uh, all these foundations in the North Sea will never be removed anymore uh, since this is also causing uh, ecological impact on the whole sea. And we have, in the future, maybe lots of artificial reefs. <laughs> Good uh, for so diving. There was one more question behind me here. And then um, if we can deal with that, and then people can get off to their 12 o'clock appointments. Or we can yes. Them. So who? You? Yeah. <coughs> so you touched very briefly about uh, energy storage, particularly for energy. Mm -hmm. So how does energy storage factor into this energy transition? Is it considered, or is it even considered at all? Yeah. it's. Uh, it's uh, considered because it's also a main driver since we have lots of wind energy in the region and we try to make it more storable. Um, so there we even combine it with bioenergy plants, uh, uh, power to gas, uh, for example. We have a, a power to gas plant uh, nearby um, where they make uh, gas out of it. Uh, so you know, you might be familiar with it, that you can make hydrogen and also methane out of it. Um, there's something where I see a big chance for fuel cell driven cars. I'm quite in favor of fuel cell driven cars, uh, um, but it's not the technology coming up in Germany since we have no um, uh, hydrogen supply. So even if you have a fuel cell driven cars, you, you cannot uh, uh, get your uh, hydrogen in it. But we have lots of uh, bioenergy plants around, and so you c could provide hydrogen uh, from uh, the biogas. And uh, the power to gas that we are, um, that is um, being done in our region, they provide methane out of it and then injecting it into the grid, and you know gas can be stored um, uh, as well. But I think um, they're just missing the step, and they do the step anyway. They have the step of producing hydrogen but it's just confirmed, um, um, transferred into uh, methane. So that's being done, not in a big style, but they have already started doing it. Thank you.